This wonderful hymn, by the way, goes on. Charles Wesley wrote 14 verses. He got a bit carried away. They are all beautiful, but we would be here all day singing them, so we'll restrain ourselves. <laughs> but it's beautiful. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Open our ears, our minds, our hearts this day that we may receive the word you have for us. In Christ's name and in his embrace we pray. Amen. Long before the night, when Jacob is seized by the stranger on the shore of the river Jabbok, he was wrestling. It started before he was even born. While he was still in his mother's womb, Jacob was wrestling with his twin brother Esau. The tussle was all about which one of them would be born first. Talk about sibling rivalry. It was so intense for these two that Genesis assumes it must have started from the earliest moment, from the very start, before they were even born. But since birth order was no small matter, perhaps the feud is a little less surprising. In those days, the firstborn son was the one who got the goods, all of them. The lion's share of the family wealth and the father's blessing. As a practice, it didn't do much to promote congenial family relations. As it turned out, Esau was the one to emerge first. But Jacob, he was born holding on to his brother, onto his heel with a firm grip. We can feel for Jacob and the injustice of birthright favor, but as the story unfolds, it becomes clear that Jacob will live up to his name, which means heel, or supplanter, or overreacher. Jacob turns out to be a rascal. As greedy and grasping as the day he was born. So even though Jacob lost the first match at birth, he didn't lose the next ones. Esau, by the way, grew up to be a big and burly bear of a man who spent all of his time outdoors and was doted on by his father Isaac. Jacob, on the other hand, was more of a homebody. His mother Rebecca's favorite, and she did nothing to discourage his wily ways. And in fact, she helped him. Jacob made it clear that he was determined the inheritance intended for Esau would be his. He got it first over a bowl of soup. One day when Esau came in from a hunt, exhausted and ravenously hungry, Jacob weaseled out of his brother the promise that he would give Jacob his share of the family money in exchange for some bread and some stew. It's an odd episode in their relationship, a funny one. But then things get more serious. When their fa father Isaac was old and nearly blind, Jacob and his mother Rebecca came up with a plan to fool the old man. When Esau was out hunting again, Jacob put on an animal skin and his brother's clothes to disguise himself. And he sat down at his father's bedside until Isaac, thinking it's Esau next to him, knowing that it certainly smelled like Esau and felt like Esau, gave Jacob the blessing that he intended for the firstborn son. When Esau came home and found out what had happened and what Jacob and his mother have done, he was beside himself with rage. By obtaining the blessing and the birthright, Jacob had secured all the advantages of family, wealth, and power. His scheme had made him rich. 
It also made his brother furious, so mad that Esau threatened to kill him. Afraid for his life, Jacob ran away, far away. He ran to another country, to the land of one of his mother's relatives named Laban, who soon became his father-in-law. Laban, it turned out, is tricky and manipulative too. And for a while it appears that Jacob has met his match. In the end, however, Jacob managed to outdo him, not only by duping Laban into giving him most of the livestock, but also by running off with both of Laban's daughters and his servants and just about everything else in the household. With his in-laws now in pursuit of him, because Jacob has run away again, he decides that he's tired of running away. And so after being away for 20 years, he heads back home. And so he went, with all of the spoils of his exploits spilling out over the landscape, he made his way home. And this is where we pick up our scripture reading. As he draws near to the river Jabbok, on the border of his homeland, Jacob receives word that his brother Esau is coming out to meet him with 400 men with him, a company the size of an army. And Jacob assumes that his brother is coming to attack him. He is again afraid for his life. But since he can't turn back and go the other way, he decides to send everything and everyone on ahead of him. At the very front of the caravan, there are gifts for Esau. Servants escorting hundreds of animals, flocks of sheep and goats and cattle and donkeys and camels. They are peace offerings for his brother. Honest or oily, they are meant to grease the way for a reunion the next day. So now, here beside the river, on the border of the home he ran away from and the brother he escaped or abandoned, depending on your perspective, Jacob spends the night. He is all alone. It's an important night, a time when it seems that all the days and nights of Jacob's life come together, or rather, they come apart in the sense that Jacob's life is broken open. Alone in the darkness, unencumbered by the accumulated clutter in his life, Jacob is suddenly seized by something or someone. An unknown assailant grasps him more fiercely than he himself has ever grasped after anything. The identity of the wrestler is strikingly ambiguous. We don't know his name. We don't see his face. And so we wonder, is it a thief come to steal from him retribution for all Jacob has stolen from others? Is it the wrath of Esau from which Jacob had run away in the first place? Is it Jacob's own anxiety over the imminent meeting with his estranged brother? Is it his own guilt, his own conscience come to haunt him in the dark? Perhaps it's an internal struggle between his shadow side and something that is now pushing and pulling him to be better than he is. Perhaps it's something even larger and greater, something fierce and tenacious that has grasped hold of him and does not want to let him go. Who is this stranger who attacks Jacob in the middle of the night? Is it a ghost from the past? Is it Jacob himself? Is it God? We don't really know, but then again, who is it that any of us wrestle with when we are up in the middle of the night? 
What is it that you struggle with in the wee hours when you feel most alone and vulnerable? And where is God in the midst of it? One way to understand the life of faith, I believe, is as a response to the invitation to wrestle, to consider hard questions that don't have easy answers, like, who is God anyway? And who are we? And where is God when we are struggling or when anyone is suffering? And if we do believe in God, what difference does it make in the world and in the way we live our lives? What's also challenging about all this is that there is nothing about the Christian life and the journey of faith that ever says, someday we'll have all the answers. Nothing that promises that one day in this life we'll be finished with it, that our journey will be complete and we will have arrived at our destination. The poet Maya Angelou said it always startled her whenever anyone walked up to her and said, I'm a Christian. Her response was always the same. What? Already? It's in living the questions, immersing ourselves in them, that we find life's meaning and direction. Every question we explore makes us more adept at honing the questions which take us deeper. Every ambiguity we wrestle with strengthens us for dealing with life's inevitable complex complexities with greater integrity. Because ultimately the life of faith is a journey into mystery, the mystery that is God. It's also a willingness to let ourselves be done over by that mystery, to be changed by it, which is what happens to Jacob. He is changed. For one thing, he is wounded in the hip by his encounter with this stranger. I take that to mean he will never again be able to flee from his adversaries. He must stay and face them. He isn't able to run away, not even from Esau. And make no mistake about it, Esau is on his way. Jacob sees him coming now. Esau is running towards him, and Jacob is shaking. Genesis tells us that Jacob bows down and then Esau is upon him. He grabs him and he tackles him. But it's not the fighting match that Jacob expected. It's a big bear hug. Esau throws his arms around his brother and he holds him. He hugs him and he kisses him and he weeps. They both do. Esau is completely overcome with joy, and Jacob is completely overcome with surprise. Esau is filled not with anger, but with tenderness as he receives his long-lost brother, as he meets the wives and the children, as he warmly and kindly welcomes them home. He asks Jacob what all the herds of animals that preceded his arrival are about. And when Jacob explains that they're gifts, Esau turns them down. Keep them, Esau says. I have plenty. Keep what's yours. But Jacob insists otherwise and finally persuades Esau to accept the gifts when he says, seeing your face is like seeing God's face. Earlier in the morning, 